All right, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, this is timestamp uh, April 4th. Uh, this is the uh, sales enablement session. We're gonna be covering, uh, my name is Dan Gordon, technical marketing. Uh, we're gonna be covering a click-through demo of the secure capabilities. Uh, click-through demo is basically a uh, PowerPoint or slideshow uh, full of screenshots that are created in such a way that a person can get the sense that they're going through the product, but it is also guided. Um, so it's a good pickup and learn. Uh, all of the uh, things that I'm saying are, should be in the speaker notes, so you can pick it up and sit on a plane and read through it and, and practice to yourself. Uh, and when you give this or this, present this to someone, you're not hiding the fact that you're not in the product because you get the feel of what the product interacting with it is like. All right. So I'll we'll start sharing. This is who can share. Uh, okay, so you should be seeing my uh, slideshow. Go ahead and start the presentation mode. I'll do that because I can keep keep it contained within a window. So this is, as I mentioned, the, uh, the secure uh, capability. So this is the secure stage, um, which is focused around application security. And we start by just talking about there's a, there, there are a lot of tools out there. Uh, and what we've learned over time and heard from customers again and again is that the ability to deliver uh, on, uh, on the promises of DevOps and, and on quick application delivery uh, of quality products is hampered uh, quite considerably by the fact that they have to spend a lot of time maintaining the food chain uh, and integrating all the different pieces together. With GitLab, uh, we have capabilities across all of those uh, all of the stages integrated together, working uh, out of the box so that that integration doesn't have to be done by the customer, but uh, you can pick it up uh, and you can start using it, put your code in, and getting the secure applications out the other end. This particular demo is going to focus on this secure stage here that we have highlighted, uh, and in particular on the capabilities there uh, around what kind of scanning uh, and security will do. Just a quick overview, uh, you know, I think continuous security is what we want to talk about here. It, it, the notion of doing waterfall security with iterative development, obviously there's a, a, a mismatch there. Uh, and so really what we need to do is have iterative application security to match iterative development. If we're going to quickly do small iterations uh, of changes to our product, we need the security to work in the same way. And what we're about to show you is that capability, how, how GitLab can enable and empower the development team to become part of the security team by giving them all the information up front about the security levels of their application and their changes. Uh, and even the ability to fix and resolve those changes before it gets pushed back to uh, to the main branch and before the security team even has to pick it up and start worrying about all of the changes that develop. Hey, Dan, your audio is a little bit muffled at times. It, sometimes it's okay, but other times some of your words are hard to okay. Thank you. I will try and enunciate better. I'm on, yeah, my, my head's just not quite working, so I'm, I'm working with uh, my unusual audio setup. So thank you. Give me, let me know again if, uh, if I drown out uh, and talk up. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to start with planning and creating. Uh, this is, uh, this is it, an area that the development team starts at. And so because we're talking about how GitLab is helping application security, uh, we're going to look at it from the developer's perspective. Uh, a developer is going to start by, by looking at their issues that they're going to work with, or they're going to have issues that they're working with. Uh, in this case, we, we have a change that we want to make to the main page. Uh, GitLab has issue boards that are usable to, that, that can be used to keep track of all the work that needs to be done and what stage they're in. I, oops. If I jump into that issue, I can see uh, just a quick brief there. There's some changes that we want, we want to make to the main page. Uh, normally, uh, I would create a merge request from there when I'm ready to start working on the solution. So the issue is the problem statement or the use, the use case or the user story we need to solve for. And the uh, merge request is the start of the solution. And that solution or that merge request captures everything around our solution. 
In this particular case, we've already run through this, uh, and so there's a merge request already created, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. So I'm in the merge request, and this merge request, as I mentioned, captures all of the discussion, all of the changes, all the test results, uh, all the information about the change that the developer is working on. Okay, remember the issue is the problem statement. Uh, this uh, particular merge request, we see that things, it's already been run through. I can go and I can even see like the changes that were made, for example. We changed uh, the background color, uh, we changed the string, uh, we added the logo here. So I can get a quick understanding of what was changed uh, as part of the solution. I can also see the pipeline that ran uh, in order to uh, run that change through and validate and test it. So we'll take a look at that pipeline. And this is what, where we start thinking about verifying. This is really where we're verifying the work that we've done. Uh, this particular pipeline is one that runs out of the box when you get GitLab, it's called Auto DevOps. And it does many things, one of which is it picks up the code and it figures out how to build it. Uh, and then we're going to focus in here on this area where, uh, where we're doing a lot around test. Uh, and in the test stage out of the box, we're running many different pieces of, uh, of the security application suite. Uh, we're doing code quality checks for one, um, and that's not security based, that's just static analysis and looking at uh, you know, are we making good quality decisions around our code uh, and how we lay it out and the syntax and everything. Uh, the container scanning, which is going to focus around the application environment, the container uh, that, that our application is being put into, because it's not enough just to secure the, the code, we need to make sure that where it's running is secure as well. Uh, dependency scanning uh, over here uh, is going to look at all of, the, uh, all of the other libraries, all the other software that our code, our, our software is dependent on, and it's going to check those to make sure that those don't have vulnerabilities, or if they do, they will flag that as well. So. Uh, especially in this day where more and more open source software is being used to build uh, other software, we want to be cognizant of the vulnerabilities in those packages as well. Then it will do, and is doing all these in parallel, so it's scaling out and doing this in parallel, but it will also be doing license management scanning. Uh, so this is doing a license compliance check. It's looking again at those, at, at those uh, dependencies and it's understanding the licenses that are attached to those uh, libraries, those dependencies so that we can make sure we don't accidentally adopt licenses that are against our policy. So for example, I made this organization not be okay with adopting a license that says, if I use their code, I need to give away for free all of my code and my software. Uh, that, uh, so that can be flagged uh, in a policy and then license management will scan through every time a developer makes a change to make sure that we haven't adopted one of those licenses accidentally. Uh, and again, if you think about it, a single code change uh, in you know, a small one line change can, can add a license or new sets of licenses because we may add new uh, dependencies from that. And we're going to also do uh, static application security testing, SAST. Uh, that is going to be looking at the code itself uh, and it's going to be scanning for vulnerabilities, looking for things like buffer overflows and known, uh, known versions and things that we need to uh, watch out for uh, and repair uh, that could introduce vulnerabilities otherwise. It's going to also just do testing. This isn't part of security, but it is part of our testing stage uh, where it's going to run the developer to find tests, unit tests, functional tests, et cetera. And then once all of these are done running, uh, we're going to kick off a review app. Now this review app is, uh, is, is kind of a little bit of magic here because GitLab is tightly integrated with Kubernetes. It's going to take the changes that we've made. It's going to spin it up in an environment that is specific. It's a staging environment specific for this one change that this developer is working on, or this team is working on. Uh, this is uh, unique. A lot, of, a lot of staging happens further right in the pipeline uh, where uh, we've gone through and, and actually checked the code back into to, uh, to the lease branch or to, to our default branch. Uh, and so uh, this, is, this is much better. Uh, for every developer change, we're able to do uh, this review app. This allows a developer to actually interact with their application, not just check it based on code. This allows stakeholders to actually interact with their application or with their change. Um, and I'm pointing this out particularly in this discussion about our security capabilities because it also enables our ability to do this the next stage, which is uh, dynamic application security testing. With dynamic application security testing, we're not just looking at the code, we're actually looking to catch vulnerabilities that happen when you put all the different pieces together. So things like cross-site scripting um, uh, attacks, uh, we're, we're able to find those, and this is so DAS scanning is going to be doing that, but you know, to do that, you need a running application. Uh, and we also do performance testing as well because we have a lot of that. So this is a lot of testing that happens and goes on, uh, and 
one of the values here is that you don't have to go dig into each of these to define the results. We actually bring those all back together into this merge request. All right, so a single merge request around this, again, around the change that the developer or the team is making. Uh, and all that information comes back here. For example, here is that review app. I can easily go and take a look and I can see my changes took place. Again, this is a simple app, but we could do a full application. Uh, we're gonna take a look now at some of the results of those scans, license compliance in this case, the development team can take a look from the merge request or the management team or anyone else. Uh, of, are there any new licenses that were introduced as part of this change? In this case, there weren't, but we can also take a look at the full report of of all of the uh, um, all of the code, and we can see that overall we're using uh, nine licenses of different sorts. I can dig into those licenses uh, and understand, go get more information about it, uh, and we can also see all the packages that we are using as part of our software that are using that license. Uh, so we can get a good sense and overview of, of where our vulnerabilities might be. Uh, I can blacklist if I have the permissions uh, set in this project. I can blacklist a license or approve a license. Uh, so that it doesn't flag um, or that it does flag. For now, we'll just leave this alone. Uh, again, if I have permissions, I can manage uh, at the project level and I can actually preset a policy that says these are the licenses that are okay, these are the ones that we don't want to have. And then that will get flagged with every change of developer makes. Moving on, uh, I, we also did a lot of different security scanning and uh, I can look at those vulnerabilities again right from the MR. I'm going to scroll down and give us a little bit of room here. Uh, and right in the MR, I can expand and see I got 59 new vulnerabilities. Yikes, that was some pretty bad changes that I made there. Uh, and those are listed here. So I can take action right here from the MR, from the merge request. Uh, for example, this first one, uh, predictable pseudo random number generator, I can go in and get the details. I can uh, go uh, deeper into that here. Um, and I'll, I'll just stop for a minute from my, from my spiel to point out there is a, this is the kind of shortened version. You see there's a lot of boxes layered on top of uh, you know, pointing out lots of things at once. Uh, there's a longer version of this also available, uh, which does uh, go a box at a time, but it also uh, goes a little bit deeper in areas like this, for example, where you, know, you can go and actually see the, the source of the information. And so um, that's also available. Uh, this is the like 10 minute version or so. Um, so back into, uh, into the presentation. Uh, I can get more information about that vulnerability. I can see all the details about it. Uh, I can, from here, dismiss the vulnerability. Uh, I can create uh, uh, an issue from the vulnerability, or if it, or one's already been created, I can view that. So here, we'll just go ahead and cancel. And come back here. I can also see exactly where uh, in my code, my changes, that vulnerability got triggered. So this is very helpful for troubleshooting and resolving issues. If I dismiss the vulnerability, it looks like this in the print in the uh, in, in the vulnerability list out um, crossed out. When I go get details, I can see who dismissed it on what pipeline. More information about that dismissal. Now you may be saying to yourself, "Well, hold on, we're giving the developers the 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 power to basically shuffle stuff under the carpet," and that's not the case. Uh, if I dismiss the develop vulnerability as a developer, it's going to carry through. Um, so vulnerabilities that don't get fixed are going to bubble up to the project level. So we can take a look here at the project level, in this case, Spring App Secure Server, right? So that, remember, that was on my change, right? And there's lots of developers working on the change for this one project. At the project level, there's a security dashboard that rolls up everything, it looks at master, and then tells me about my vulnerabilities that are in my master branch. Now I can see that that, that the, uh, that the uh, Cypher uh, one that I dismissed is also still here and, and showing dismissed. Um, Again, this is at the team level. So you may be asking, okay, well, wait a minute. What about the security, uh, you know, the security team, the ad security admins, the analysts, are they expected to go down into all of the different projects and all the different merge requests and look for vulnerabilities to verify that things are getting you know, dealt with? No, they're not. Um, if I switch to now looking at the group security dashboard, and this is where more security admin or analysts will be looking at, uh, I can go up to the group level and then group in GitLab is a hierarchical structure that I can make to have you know, represent my departments or my groups or larger sets of uh, projects that work together. So there's lots of projects under a group and that group has a security dashboard looks a little bit different that rolls up that information and all the vulnerabilities from, from all of the projects below. I can filter by severity, by report type, by project. Uh, I can get an overall view, hey, there's seven you know, high, high vulnerabilities here in this, in this group. 
um, I can get trending information. Um, so uh, um, you know, that, that live adjusts to what I'm looking at. And I can also see those vulnerabilities again across the different projects. So like in this case, I can see that all of these critical or all these highs are in, in, in tests. So I don't worry about that. Uh, I can also get a quick view as, as an administrator. Okay, I can see that uh, as a security person, sorry, that that a vulnerability has been found, but somebody's also created uh, a issue against that. Uh, so that's going to be dealt with. I can go look at that and I can interact with that person uh, through, through the system. Uh, I can also see those ones that were dismissed that got bubbled up. So I can and, and take action on them. I can get more information. I can decide to create an issue and assign it to someone and say, hey, this needs to be dealt with. And I can undismiss it as well. So at a high level, I have the ability to take action as a, as a security you know, admin uh, to not have to dive, dive, delve, dive deep into you know, the, the merge requests and the, the lower level. So speaking of, I talked about uh, we're really about empowering the development team to uh, to fix the problems before the security admin has to catch them and say you can't ship this this is no good right this you know, kick it back we want those discoveries to happen and be fixed as early as possible so i'm going to talk about remediation one of the things we're focused on is what we call auto remediation and along the way there are several capabilities that we're introducing to enable that uh, uh, we're looking at a project here where i found uh, in, an issue um, their vulnerability. Uh, and if we look at that vulnerability, uh, one of the things we have, and this is in today's product, two things we have. One is the ability to download the patch. So we've identified uh, what the problem is. We've identified where the, what the patch is. I can look at that. I can download that as a developer, get apply it to my code, uh, and then commit that back in uh, to, uh, to have it go through the cycle and resolve the problem. Now, the other thing we have that we just recently added in the last release is the ability to start the merge request um, uh, and apply the fix. So I can do that right from here, which will then set me up with the branch and everything so that I can apply that fix. Now where we're heading to the, in, in the fullness of what we're going here is to have those vulnerabilities found and fixed automatically. Now this, we're not there yet. We're working towards that. But you could imagine as a, de as a developer, rather than coming in and seeing a message that I have security vulnerabilities that I need to fix, uh, I'll be able to come in and see that there were vulnerabilities and that they have been fixed. And that's where we're, where we're going with this. So that is a quick overview of uh, secure capabilities within GitLab. So Dan, I had a quick question about the last slide. Yep. Um, so whenever you hit create merge requests, obviously this creates an entirely new merge request rather than just adding on a commit to the offending merge request? Uh, I believe that's the case, yes. Okay. Cool. As, as a uh, because uh, this change may be right. When we do merge requests, we want to do small ones that have a small change associated with them so we can keep track of like what's doing what. If I make a merge request and I make some code changes, like I change the front page and I also fix a bug and, or, and I also fix security vulnerabilities under that same single merge request, it starts getting larger and having more effect across everything. So we want to kind of compartmentalize the merge request. Yeah. Makes it harder to refer to. And that is a what is a GitLab uh, flow uh, piece that is good to point out. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Okay, um, we're going to just keep going through with questions. So, uh, um, so I'll, I'll point out um, before we do that uh, to find this. I usually like to start um, to find this and other click through demos and all the other demos. You can do a Google search um, GitLab demos. It is the top natural hit. This one is an ad. And this is the page where we've consolidated all the demos, videos, and whatnot that we'd like you to know and learn and love and, and use. Um, along here are the click throughs. I'm sure I happen to be on that. With some instructions on how to run them offline. Uh, this is the directory that has all of them. Uh, and they're also just here. You can run them from here as well. These, I believe, are set on autoplay. Um, or there are some that are on autoplay. You can get directly to the slides from here as well. So you can see there's a few of them. Uh, we have this short one that we just covered, and at the very top is the long one uh, that we pointed out. Uh, the long one does dive into um, some pieces deeper um, that, uh, that you didn't see that I kind of skimmed over the top of, uh, like, um, uh, but basically diving closer in, like when we say, hey, we could create a, uh, a uh, new issue out of the vulnerability, we actually go take a look at that so we can see that all the data is pulled in automatically, for example. Okay, 
I'm going to stop sharing. I'll let you inspire questions. If you guys have typed one into the chat, I probably haven't seen it. Uh, I will take a look, but feel free to verbalize as well. Hey, Dan, it's Dave Esther. Um, great stuff, man. Really, really impressive on the demo there. Uh, one uh, uh, thing, just it, it's just a minor point that I noticed on the project security dashboard, mm -hmm. um, you said you know, it detects on the master uh, branch, which it does, if that's the default. The only thing, that, it just detects the default uh, branch. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sure you know that, but 98% uh, of the time it's going to be master, but just in case somebody, I changed my default branch. That's why it's that. the only thing I noticed on that. But That's awesome. a very good point. Thank you. Cool. Sure. Good, good to call that out. I'll make that adjustment. Anyone else? Questions, comments? Uh, there was a question in the chat, Dan, um, from Mike. Is there any demo for how to onboard a project into SAST uh, and make sure it's scanning fully? Um, to onboard a project into SAST. Um, there's no demo on that particular right now. Um, if there's a, a method need for that or that would be valuable, we can certainly work on that. Um, and by onboarding, I think you it's particularly focused on the scanning fully. Is that? Yeah. Is that so I can I can talk to that. Sorry. Um, the the process for like getting a project into check marks is a you know two to six month sort of task and for any existing code base. Because you have to make sure that the scanner understands the code. You have to make sure that the rules make sense. You have to remove or add or change rules to make the, the results actionable and reasonable. You don't want like a million false positives. You don't want a million false negatives, right? So, the, so there's a whole onboarding procedure that they like to sell as a uh, professional service sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any, any material on how to approach that at all? Uh, we don't, but I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah, yeah. so we can, uh, you know, I'm part of it is, right, part of the idea here is that you don't need to uh, do a six-month onboarding. Now, granted, there's a different level of output right now between what we, you know, we do and what they, you know, ultimately do. They're, they're the super tool right now. Um, and we're, we're, we're getting, you know, we're working towards that. Um, ability to identify false positives and things like that, I think, will come. Um, but right now, uh, you know, part of this idea is right. We are looking at what is the software. We're figuring out what do we need to scan for. Part of what the magic that happens behind the scenes is okay. We're doing SAS. Well, which which language and and you know what what do we what do we run right? Uh, and so we're figuring that out behind the scenes. Granted, I, that doesn't cover all of the complexities that check marks and check covers today, but that is the start of the path and the philosophy is that you don't exactly what you're saying need, you know, six month engagement by, by professional services in order to, you know, to, to get that level of scanning. You know, that's what we're working towards. Okay. Thank you. Again, mm -hmm. I would even suggest your auto DevOps one because that's set it up and that's just, it does what it needs to do from, you know, being set up for auto DevOps because it's automatically going to call, you know, SAST in there. Yeah, no, that's a great point. There's a, there's a click through demo like this on Auto DevOps um, that uh, that you can look at that does talk about just getting a piece of software in and running it through the the system and getting the the SAS scans and looking at the results as well. And what is nice is we have recently templatized Auto DevOps, so each of those sections of the the pipeline are split out into their own discrete CI YAML files that you can import. And so we're actually seeing customers create very complex pipelines to do a lot of different things more so than even auto devops does but then they'll import the SaaS component or they'll import one component of the auto devops so that's another way customers are using auto the auto devops is taking that as a templatized uh way to do certain types of jobs i want to i want to address larry's question about the um, find and fix vision. The so auto remediation. There are there's we're on the second MVC. So we've uh, the first one was to um, show that a patch was available to download. The second one uh, that we have right now is to actually create the merge release for that for that patch. 
And then, um, you know, we'll continue to improve and automate e even more so we can actually run the pipeline and show the results. That'll be kind of the next part. But uh, so I don't want to leave with the impression that it's a future. It's we already have it. And, and someone had asked, uh, are other vendors doing that, are competitors doing the auto remediation? Um, they're starting to, not the traditional application security vendors that have been around forever because they're too, they're not as tied in to the development process, but some of the more recent players um, that take a little bit more of a DevOps approach are starting to do auto remediation. And in fact, um, Forrester's report that's going to be coming out shortly really points to auto remediation as being a, a, a key capability going forward for, for the, the leaders in the uh, software composition analysis space. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, the, the, the demo does show the, the, a few screenshots of, of the parts that we've done towards that. Um, and those are, those are live on GitLab.com in, in the product today. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, so there's a question from Simon about, can we scan projects that aren't going through our pipelines? Um, so uh, we're not really optimized for that, um, but you can set, uh, what I would do for that is uh, you have code that's sitting in the repository, you can set a, uh, a scan of that branch, of your default branch um, to happen um, with, with the scheduled pipeline that will basically run through and run those scans and get those results. So it is still through the pipeline that is our automation mechanism. Um, uh, but I don't think we're, we're not set up today to break off and say, just do a SAS scan on this sitting code. And get yeah, that's not check. really the strategy in terms of why you would use GitLab for, for scanning. You'd use GitLab for scanning because it's built into your CI CD process as opposed to trying to, to scan with us and then send it somewhere else. I think it, it was more like um, if there's a thousand projects and a hundred are being actively developed, let's say, but there are 900 older projects that aren't actively developed, but are still used in the company, they would want to have an, a security audit potentially of whether those live projects that aren't being actively developed are secure as well. That was the, the sort of thinking behind it. Okay. Yeah. That for that use case, we do have a plan. Yeah. Um, I can't point to it off the top of my head, but we do have a plan for that. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I had a question. Um, when uh, William was talking about uh, using the uh, template, the uh, YAML template files, uh, and many customers are pulling those in uh, for the scanning uh, now. But uh, in the case of uh, if there are a minority of projects that maybe use some older code that we don't scan against, like uh, COBOL, and maybe they want to scan those with Fortify. Are they able to take those templates and do a little customization on it so that uh, Fortify would be brought in and uh, run as part of the CI CD process with GitLab? Is that doable? Mm. Uh, you certainly could from a pipeline that's a custom pipeline call, you know, Fortify or some or any other scanner to scan uh, to scan code. Um, we don't have a snippet for that or, or a YAML file for that. Those YAML, those components that William talking about are specifically off of the pieces that we provide. Um, okay. Yeah, I think so. I think there's there's two concepts. One is uh, we have these predefined jobs, things like our SAST and DAST, and uh, Previously, you had to copy and paste code to get that kind of functionality. And now those individual types of jobs are, they just ship as templates with GitLab. This is a very recent update. So I don't, I wouldn't say we have a lot of customers do this, but I do know of customers do this and we're working to get like some webinars out. Uh, all that's to say is that's one bit of functionality. The other bit of functionality, what you're talking about is if somebody is doing some scanning on a language that we don't currently support, could they port that into the MR? And I have heard of that. I don't know. I don't know, Cindy, you probably have more depth on that use case. I'd have to understand 
why you'd want to do that. What would be the outcome you would expect for a language that we're not supporting? So it's not in the repo. You're not doing CICD on it. I'm not sure I would understand the value of that. Now I can say though, we do have customers that are importing results from other scanners into our pipeline, um, but not for like the, the use case you mentioned, COBOL, you know, it's not for something that we're not already handling. The, the, one, that I'm, the one that I'm aware of, and I, I, I'll have to dig up the details on it, but I, I do believe there's a couple, a few customers or users that are, uh, they're doing a scan and that scan outputs a certain format and they're doing a data transform on that format to put it essentially into the JSON format that our UI component ingests. And so that on the MR, they get not only our scans, but this, this other tool scans are also showing up in the MR. I see David perhaps nodding his head. Maybe you're familiar with that one. Yeah, thanks. You're, you're exactly talking the case that, that I, the, the one that I'm familiar with is that, you know, we're looking for a particular, like I said, JSON format for those results. Um, you know, this is kind of a, a you know, I don't know, if you know caveat emptor type, uh, you know, uh, approach here. But if you were to get the results of whatever external scanning tool into these appropriate exact format that we're expecting, then it's quite possible you could get it to show in the merge request. But if that format changes in any kind of way on our side, then of course, then that format's not going to show any longer. So that's, I, I've heard of that working uh, in, in that sense. I, I yeah, this is the non-supported use case, huh? Exactly. <laughs> well, I, I guess I had a, a, a similar question to that, or maybe the use case. So I've had a couple of questions from customers and the, the kind of the bottom line is, is when we talk to the security team, they're most worried about the fidelity of, of the system, right? When we talk to development, they want to understand how do we get it in the pipeline? How do we shift it left, et cetera? But the, the security team, the InfoSec team is really worried about, hey, how do we match up against either existing products that they already have that's doing type of security? Um, what's the fidelity of it? And I think they see it, the feedback I've gotten, it seems like, okay, we see you're early on in that journey. Um, and, and, and maybe we'll reevaluate you later. Yeah. Well, the, so, hold on. I, I'm sorry. We're four minutes over. I think this is a great discussion, so I hate to cut it off. I, I think we can have a whole separate session on this, and we should. Um, we know there's some, some work to do here. Um, this is uh, from the perspective of presenting what we do have. Um, uh, that's what this is covering. And uh, I want to cut it off at that. And let's maybe, maybe say we can set up a next or, uh, discussion to go deeper into it. That's yeah, I think the positioning would be um, important for y'all to understand in terms of there's a difference, those that have incumbent products and those that don't in terms of approach. So, uh, so Brad and everyone else, we'll, we'll set up a separate discussion to go deeper into that and cover that um, with enough time rather than rushing uh, an answer in the end here. So thank you all for, uh, for attending. I hope this was helpful. Um, send us feedback. Thanks.